Tracy Garrigan, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hi, Howie. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Or it's your evening, right? It's my, it's my late afternoon. <laughs> Sp Spain is weird. I discovered that, that we're, although we're sort of in the same um, la latitude, latitude as like the UK, we're like mm -hmm. the same time zone as like Poland. So it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's dark. It yeah. yeah, it's very strange. I, I, I read somewhere that it was because like Franco was a big fan of Hitler and he wanted to be in the same time zone as Germany. Huh. Um, but to this to this day, it like affects it's weird it's like the it's really dark at like 830 in the morning. Crazy. But but yeah. but I digress. <laughs> so 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 the the fun thing is like you, you and I kind of talk all the time about the logistics for the Food Revolution Network's plant-based coaching certification program. And yet here we are, and I'm so delighted to talk to you. This is like, you know, when you go bowling with your coworkers or something, it's just like a, just right? a good, we're going to have fun. Yes. Yeah. I like a little team building. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Except this is going to be very one way. You're going to get to know way too much about me. We'll have to do, oh. I'll have to make a podcast so that I can interview you. Okay, cool. Well, this is, yeah, <laughs> team building. This is, this is like, you know, um, HR mandated, like, you know, because we're, we're having so much trouble, like, working together. So this is. <laughs> <laughs> no. so, so anyway. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <sighs> so I, I wanted to talk to you about, just, I wanted to share your coaching story and your story, your, your journey to becoming a health coach. Cause you know, most of our stories are unlikely, like, like in life, but yours is, you know, not only unlikely, but like poetically. So like just mm -hmm. a, a really interesting arc. And I think it offers a lot of, uh, of insights and hope for people who, who might think like, you know, being healthy, contributing in a particular way is beyond where, where I could be. Um, so maybe we could just begin with that, with you just sort of sharing, you know, wh whatever you, th you think is relevant about, you know, from, you know, day one to, uh, to when you became a coach and I'll, and I'll butt in with, with, with rude questions along the way. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of, that's, that's so loaded because I feel like I could point to so many. Um, I feel like I've had a lot of highlights in the highlight reel. Like if, if hmm. somebody were to ask me like, Hey, you know, you could, you could uh, have a whole lot of experiences over like five lifetimes, or we could just cram it all into one. Which one do you want to pick? I'd be like, let's do it all in one. <laughs> let's, rip, let's rip the bandaid off. Yeah. Um, yeah, because like straight out the straight out the gate when I was, um, you know, when when you're going and this this is not a a position about about vaccines at all. So please, everybody listening, don't get excited. But um, yeah, everybody grounds, please. Everybody calm down. Um, <laughs> I was vaccine injured as a child when I was uh, about, you know, is it between one and a half and two where you have like kind of the, the set of vaccines. Um, it was the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine mm, that uh -huh. I, within two weeks, my entire body got very angry and um, I had, you know, flare ups and all the joints, the hands, the knuckles, the wrists, the, the, like, I wouldn't, I didn't want anybody to touch me. Apparently I was very like hypersensitive and an angry child um, because I was in pain mm. and, uh, you know, my mom and my parents didn't know what to do. They took me to, you know, uh, they found a local, when I say local, it was still going from Western Massachusetts to uh, somewhere down in Connecticut, Hartford, I want to say, to find a specialist there who understood like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, because like everything else was getting ruled out. And um, did, did they make the connection right away between the vaccine? It took a long time. And, and frankly, there was kind of the unwillingness to say that, that, you know, I, it, nobody wants to say it even today, you know, like you, you, you can't uh -huh. even say like this was a vaccine injury, but at the, at the, uh, at that time it was even more unknown and we didn't have the mm -hmm. internet and nobody really connected dots. So mm -hmm. Um, 
yeah, it was just like, oh, well, it's a coincidence. It's just a coincidence, right. you know? Mm-hmm. And I guess even to this day, I couldn't really prove that, could I? You know? No, you, it, was, it could be a coincidence. It right? could be a coincidence. <laughs> I mean, they, which, you know, which speaks to like one thing I want to say about working with you and the Food Revolution Network team is like there is such a commitment to the truth mm. that I think is 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 sorely needed because you know we've become so polarized that you have to preface talking about something that happened to you because yeah. there are there are people who don't want what you just said to have to be true because it's so inconvenient to their worldview. Right. Right. And there's plenty of people who got the MMR as kids and were protected against these horrible diseases. Absolutely. And there's a whole other group of people that doesn't want that to be true. Absolutely. And, and I love this that with you know, working with all of these food revolution. It's like what we want to be true is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, you know, that I think it's important to understand that there are like everything is not a black and white issue. And I, I don't like um landing in those areas because they're too they're not inclusive they're not inclusive of everybody's truth Mm. everybody has a truth and my truth is that i got injured but it doesn't make me an anti-vaxxer it doesn't make me want to pull it from the market and say it's dangerous for everybody you know like that's not my position so and i could say the same even later in life when i had another run-in with pharmaceuticals and i became you know highly toxic which we could talk about uh at another or maybe later but um, you know, the yeah, we're going to cram, we're going to cram five lifetimes into this interview. We are, I mean, my, me and the pharmaceutical en- industry, like I am too hypersensitive of a, of a creature. Like we just don't mix. I'm allergic to absolutely everything it seems. And so, you know, um, it, yeah, but still like I, I had, you know, really bad reactions to certain pharmaceuticals and, and I, I wouldn't sue them or try to pull them from the marketplace or, you know, have rally against it. Cause I'm sure for somebody it's going to work. Right. Yeah. And so I guess that's what I mean is like, it's, we don't have to land in a camp. We can, we can be inclusive of everybody's truth. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. So let's, let's get back to yours. So yeah. you had this, this thing and they went to Hartford and no yep. one wanted to, to say that this was a medis- medical system caused problem. Right. Um, Yeah. And so I I basically entered, I entered the medical mainstream straight out the gate with treatments and, um, you know, conventional Western medicine. So going to specialists, et cetera, my entire life. And what that meant was, um, you know, a lot of screening, a lot of getting poked and prodded, a lot of just kind of getting into the system really early and, and, uh, needing that system to, you know, they did the best they could with what they had, but here's the crazy thing. I don't know if anybody in our audience is going to come at me about this, but I'll share this one too. Um, I actually had a miracle happened. So back, this was late seventies. Yeah. Late. Yeah. My sister wasn't born yet, so it had to be under five. I went to, um, my mother found out about a a priest who was in the Catholic church and he was in this area of Western mass, New England area. His name was father DeOrio, Peter, I think it was Peter DeOrio and he's still alive uh, as far as I know. And he was considered a healer and he was doing these anointing of the sick masses, Mm. right? These, uh, gatherings. And my mom found out that there was this guy in our neighborhood who was in a wheelchair. She knew him, the whole town knew him. And he went to this mass and like got out of the wheelchair, like walked out, had a miracle. Also walked off, walked away from his wife shortly after that. (laughs) But uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So she found him, she sought him out and we went to this mass. And I remember this mass with baby clarity, which is bizarre. Like I remember um, uh, the upholstery in the van that we had and the smells and the frankincense and the, you know, all of the things. I remember um, him, the priest walking down the aisle, like with the 
smoke, the frankincense coming out of the thing, swinging it around, you know, and people dropping like flies in the pews. As he's walking down the aisle, people are just passing out, passing out, passing out. And he's coming at me and I'm a child. I'm like, oh my God, he's coming. Nothing happened. I was fine. Um, but when it came time to line up and get my blessing, I passed out and woke up like later in the car on the car ride home and my arthritis, my JRA went into full remission. And again, it was like going back to the specialist going, okay, well, I don't know what you're doing, but keep on doing it. (laughs) Funny thing. Yeah. My mom was like, okay. Uh, yeah. So I like literally had a, a miraculous halt in the progression of a very aggressive, debilitating disease disorder. And the funny thing at the time was they were like, you know, prepare for the worst. She could be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She could go blind, you know, because it affects your optic nerve when you're developing and all this other stuff. And I had none of that. Uh And just let's let's just pause for folks who might not be familiar with JRA. Can you uh, expand the abbreviation and talk about um, like briefly what it is like what 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 miraculously stopped happening? So juvenile rheumatoid arthritis um, is um, a rheumatoid arthritis that develops when you are um, young because it can affect people that are older, but it's an autoimmune disease disorder. And um, at the core, at the root is aggressive inflammation and that inflammation attacks your, um, the synovial fluid and the cartilage between the joints and it eats away at that. And it ends up like it, it eats away the lining and then it starts to eat the bone. So if anybody were to like, look at my joints in an x-ray or whatever, there's like around the, especially the wrist, you can see it's kind of, you know, messed up. I can't straighten it and they they don't really bend or work, but, um, they, it looks like Swiss cheese, almost like little teeny holes, like very Mm -hmm. porous, like coral instead of like a nice strong, bone Uh so that's it eats away that and in in the um in the meantime like it's very very painful and the other kind of side effects that are not side effects but other additional um disorders or or labels that can come along with this disease and disorder are other autoimmune inflammation related diseases such as um fibromyalgia which is basically a whole like uh muscular skeletal neuromuscular skeletal thing where it feels like you're just constantly um i know <laughs> it's like you have rigor mortis and you're bruised it's like mm-hmm. you're super stiff and everything hurts and you can't move and you don't want to like flinch and and if anybody touches you it's like they it's like you're they're touching something that's like really bruised it just hurts all over mm-hmm. So and did, did you start having uh, symptoms of that? That came that came later in my 20s. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I all right. Let's I had, like, I had no the early onset where I had, was injured and then I had like the like really aggressive JRA happen. And then I had this like miraculous halting for um, I wanted to say like over a decade and a half. Hmm. And then somewhere around puberty. Um, I think obviously hormones are involved or maybe it was a just deep lack of faith at the time. I don't know, um, <sighs> that it all kicked in again and got aggressive again. And so that's when the medications came in. That's when I just went to conventional medicine mm. and started to kind of layer on the medications. You didn't go back to father Diorio. No, no, no. <laughs> so well, I'm curious. Cur- by that point, I didn't believe in that stuff. You said, sorry, I missed what you just said. I was going through my Gothic phase. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, knowing, knowing where you have ended up, whether mm. that experience like made you interested in healing or you, you, maybe you were, you were just so exhausted of being a patient, you didn't want to have anything else to do with it. Like, do you think this, that, that both the disease and the miraculous remission planted any seeds? To go to coaching, you mean? And anything around like being interested in health and medicine and Oh no. I I actually um 
you know, Ocean likes to say pain, pain pushes, vision pulls. Mm -hmm. um, I was not interested in forming any kind of a healthy vision by any means. I was, I was in my 20s. I was in New York City. I was a fashion designer. I was living it up. I was partying every night. You know, um, I, I was the furthest, the furthest thing from health that there uh -huh. is. I mean, I was working 24 seven. And if I wasn't at working, I was at happy hour or, you know, just going out how, with my friends. How'd you end up in New York in fashion? Childhood dream. You know, I wanted to be like every good, isn't there that, that joke that like, you know, every high school boy wants to be in the rock band and every high school girl wants to be a fashion designer. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, no. What was, what was your I, high school I, I, dream, Howie? <laughs> um, so, something between secretary of education and uh, <laughs> left fielder for the New York Yankees, I'm afraid. Wow. Wow. I had no idea. Uh, but I was pretty <laughs> nerdy. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think you should ask me about uh, larger cultural movements. <laughs> Oh, I was just a total social butterfly. All I wanted to do was be out and party and have a great time and, you know, be in the scene. And uh -huh. um, so, it, so it came true. You, you got to New York City, which is the a center of the fashion world. Yeah, we got to. Yeah, and it sounds like you were world. you were in the scene and partying in it. And I was having a grand old time and my body did not want to cooperate. Basically, I just. You know, I wasn't feeding it right. I wouldn't sleep for days. I was drinking too much. I was, you know, all the stress and, you know, I was, uh, if we looked at the pillars of lifestyle medicine, okay, I was scoring like a zero, <laughs> like all of those things. <laughs> and I didn't understand their importance. I never had an example of it. I didn't grow up, you know, in a home where that was modeled in any way. You know, my mother uh -huh. was a single mom. She worked the night shift. We ate fast food. We, you know, we were in survival mode. And I never really knew how to take care of myself as, as a human organism. Hmm. I, I didn't understand. And I thought, hey, why not? If not? And the people that I was surrounded by were living the same crazy life. So, right. Yeah. M M Moscow Mule is hydration, right? Gin and tonic, yes. Yeah, it was my jam. Yeah, but... tonic, right? That's, <laughs> that's literally water. Right. <laughs> yeah, the lime was probably the healthiest thing I had in my life <laughs> at that point. Yeah, how you avoid scurvy. Yeah, and I used to joke that I would like use my oven to store sweaters. You know, I didn't know how to cook. I had no interest in it. I just, I had FOMO. I wanted to be out all the time. Uh-huh. But anyway, but that, you know, my body had other plans for me. And, and even beyond that, my soul had other plans for me because mm -hmm. I also felt a, a huge misalignment with the work I was doing in the world. How you so? Know? Um, I just didn't feel like the world needed another dress. I didn't feel, you know, like I, I had the childhood little teenage fantasy and I made it come true and I made the money. And, and then I was like, this is stupid. Uh -huh. <laughs> like this is so stupid why am i why am i wasting my my time and my talents and my brain this way like this is and i did you know i would have to travel for work and see factories in china and this and that and i just felt like i could i was seeing the damage done mm. on a global scale of what i was participating in and i was starting to feel really not okay with it like what, like labor issues or, or environmental costs? All of it. Yeah. I remember going to Shenzhen and just like, I, I could taste the pollution dripping down the back of my throat. Like you couldn't see, like you, there's never a sunny day. You couldn't see the sun because the, the haze of the pollution just kind of from, like. From the, from the textile factories and factories in general, not only textiles, because that was a pretty, you know, Shenzhen's like, they manufacture a lot of different things, but just the pollution and just knowing that, oh my goodness, I'm directly contributing to this. Like to this day, I don't buy new things. I, I prefer to buy used things now. Hmm. 
but um it was because of that trip that i was like Oy, i think it's time to become a collector of vintage so you you were in hathaway and the devil wears prada I was every character in The Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> <laughs> I was every character. <laughs> I've been a little bit of a mall. Okay. Yeah. It was a fun movie, huh? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm, I, uh, uh, so your, your body shut down and said, uh-uh, your soul. Um, my soul was misaligned. I felt like I wasn't doing work that I believed in and I didn't find purpose in. I didn't find joy in. I was doing well um and but my body started buckling and i started to lean more on conventional medicine so i started to <clears throat> take the drugs i was taking um um some anti-inflammatory stuff like what was what i'm thinking of uh i don't want to use names of pharmaceuticals but <laughs> just you know biologic response modifiers chemotherapies painkillers um De anti-depression meds, mm. anti-anxiety meds, sleep meds, pain meds. Mm. Um, I was up to about eight medications for a while and I was really losing my ability to, um, to think and read and write and get myself around. And, um, mm. and meanwhile, yeah. the pain is still going up and up and up and up and up. And I just started to like, there was, yeah, I basically ended up being bedridden and out of work for a while. Mm -hmm. Did you have a sense of whether you were unique in the fashion industry or whether, you know, just sort of any sort of high powered young person, um, you know, hip industry, whether there's like loads of people living that, you know, party, whatever, cocaine, gin and tonic fueled life? Mm -hmm. who are in the background, like medicating up to their eyeballs just to get up the next morning? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know. Everybody's journey is so unique, you know? I don't, I've, I don't think I've ever met anybody in the same boat, like having a similar experience as me with regards to that um, mm -hmm. chemical-fueled life. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking, like, if you're going out to parties, you're 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 seeing reflected back at you people who probably look like they're functioning well. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, no, okay. So another thing about me is that I'm um, highly intuitive and empathic, and I can sense people's pain points. Mm. Most like a. I don't see auras, but I feel energies in the sense of like, I can easily see the shadows in people and I know where their pain points are and like what, so I could always see that there was, um, kind of like when you look at, say, say you cut a tree and you look at the rings of a tree and you can see like where there was a forest fire. Yeah. Uh huh. I feel that off of people and I can feel like what they're dealing with and why and hmm. I just kind of tenderly avoid that thing with them so that they're hmm. not triggered or traumatized by me uh -huh. but, <laughs> but, um, so I could I could always sense that somebody was in pain like everybody's in pain we're all the walking wounded right hmm. and everybody that I would encounter I knew was driving the struggle bus in their own way for like mm -hmm. some other reason. Uh -huh. and, yeah. I don't know that I answered you, but not, not the same story as me, but a story. Uh -huh. and so right. there, there's nobody I've ever come across where I'm like, wow, they've got it all figured out. Like, no, <laughs> never. Mm -mm. Hmm. Well, that's, that, sounds, that sounds like a helpful trait for a coach. Yeah, I have the experiences often where they're like, I've never told anybody that. How did you know that? Mm. <laughs> like, uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. See, this is why I'm interviewing you and you're not interviewing me. <laughs> but see if I can keep my secrets. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's not like, you know, facts or anything. It's not like I know the thing. It's just that I can tell there, I can sense that that's a thing. I don't know, mm. I don't know how to describe it. Anyway. Mm. 
All right, so you were bedridden. Bedridden. Uh, what, what was the next step or stage? Um, so that is when things got a little nuts. Um, I was home from work, taking all these meds, and um, really losing my ability to function independently. And um, I would watch, you know, say TV or something like that. And I'm watching TV and I'm like, I'm never gonna, you know, there's a wedding scene, I'm never gonna get married. There's a, you know, pregnant woman having a baby, I'm never gonna have a baby. There's um, somebody going to dancing on the beach, I'm never gonna dance again. Like mm. there was like a complete um, shedding of any like idea of the future. Mm. I just basically thought like, well, this is it. And you're what, like 28, 29 at this point? Um, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Or, so, so it's no, a long. I'm sorry, maybe 30, 31. 30. Okay. But yeah. still, it's a very long non-future to be contemplating. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I looked and I'm like, God, everything I'm looking at, I'm no, I'm never going to be able to participate in again. Mm. And like, there's this like kind of cut off from the world. It's extremely isolating um, on all fronts because you just like, oh, there's life happening out there and I'm never going to be in it again. And you start to just, you know, get in your head and retreat and whatever. And at the same time, I was having so much pain that I couldn't sleep. So, and then also swallowing and breathing became really hard. Um, so I was taking these like really shallow breaths and you know, something about breath work, right? So like little mm -hmm. shallow breaths, um, aren't great, yeah. uh, you know, and especially if you're doing that days and weeks at a time, not sleeping with that. Um, I just got into like a really weird brain state where I was not really in my body. Yeah, well, both both of those are threat symbol signals, right? Shallow breaths mm. tells your body that there's an imminent danger, and not sleeping tells your body it's too dangerous to close your eyes. So it's, it's you know, the one of the interpretations of both of those is like, I could die at any second. I have to, you know, be vigilant, which, yeah. which then of course, <laughs> you know, d dumps all the stress chemicals, which makes things even worse. Yeah. And, and I was still taking all these meds. So I was still loony, highly mm. toxic and I'm and polluted and having that physical response. And then with all the pain and I really wanted to escape it. Um, I didn't see any hope for resolution. I was seeing, I have was seeing seven specialists. At the time, I had two rheumatologists, I had my primary, I had a neurologist, I had um, my OBGYN, which is important in this conversation because of the, I was also taking a patch, like a hormone patch, which mm -hmm. is no longer on the market. Is um, it a contraceptive? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, but the thought was that it will work like as an antidepressant too. I don't know. Uh -huh. There's, there was all of these kind of like, well, let's try this, you know? Uh -huh. um, and of course, none of these doctors talk to one another and the, I don't, I don't even know enough to talk to the pharmacist about it. Like, does this work with that? Da, 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 da. Like, no, I'm just taking all the stuff. So I was just like a, a pharmacological uh, cocktail, you know, walking around and all of this stuff isn't working. So I'm upping it. Even the biological response modifier was a drip. I would have to go take this infusion. She was like, Oh, you're having breakthrough symptoms. Let's increase the dose, you know? So everything's going up and up and up and up and I'm dying. Mm. So I'm, I'm laying there like Michael Jackson, sorry. And <laughs> I'm just like really out of it. Like, uh, and I, night after night after night of this without sleeping, I get into this state where I start feeling like I'm leaving my body. I think I'm leaving my body. I'm tethered. I'm floating. I'm not understanding reality. I think I'm seeing people in the room. Um, 
And I started day after day to like feel the rhythm of the world around me locally. Like I could hear, you know, the, the gates go up in the morning and the cars, certain cars leaving for work at the certain time and the birds mm. come up at a certain time. And, and were, were you all alone? Was there someone like taking care of you? I was alone at this point. And my <sighs> mom came and stayed for a little while, but she could only stay so long. And then I was alone. Mm. Um, and there was, you know, debate around like, should I go? I, I stayed with friends here and there, but couch surfing when you're like that is so not helpful. Mm -hmm. It was just better to be home. Um, yeah. Anyway, so one night I was laying in bed and like identifying with, you know, of course you're, you're in your head. Like you, every sim single person that we know knows what it's like to put your head on the pillow at night and like that that's where all of your deepest, darkest thoughts come in. That's when you're like solving the problems of the world and ruminating on your life. And the, the, like your life is flashing before you kind of every single night. Yeah. And so that was me in pain, wanting to escape on a ton of drugs, not sleeping night after night after night. And I would just lay there all night ruminating. There was never the ability to drop off to sleep. Sounds like hell. It was. And that would then went on for weeks until finally I was like, I surrender. Just take me. Like, let's go. Mm. And at that point, <laughs> that admission, that surrender, um, I found a really deep, great purpose in the lesson that I was getting, which was suffering. I'm like, ah, this is what it's about. This humility, this suffering, this pain, like this, this is the stuff of life. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Not that I'm supposed to be stuck in suffering, but I'm meant to under, I just believed at that moment I was meant to understand what was happening. And I was meant to do something with that and I chose to stay alive and not leave because I believed that my purpose then became about staying to help relieve the suffering of all other sentient beings. Hmm. And so that's what I fired all my doctors in my mind at that moment. I started to pay attention to um, energy. And when I say that, like there was, there's just a negative charge and a positive charge. I'll keep it super simple. There's a negative charge and a positive charge to every single thought we have. The song on the radio, the conversation with the friend, the apartment you live in that you hate, the job you hate, like every single thing has a charge. And I recognize like if it has a negative charge, I have to, like I could feel it in my body. It was pain. It would translate to pain. Mm. If I had a, a loving, joyful conversation, it would create some relief. So I became like a thermometer almost of like the positive and the negative charges of stuff. And I just started to pay attention to that. And my question was, is this fill in the blank healthy for me? And if it was the song on the radio and it was a no, it was like too aggressive, too violent, too whatever, change the channel. Like I started to listen to my bod my biofeedback almost, my energetic feedback around every micro decision of the day. And that nutrition wasn't the first thing that I embraced. Nutrition was something I embraced as a result of that question. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And you had had you had had a lot of practice being sensitive to energy. Um, were you did you did you know that that was like you know somebody could have a gift and think that everybody's that way? Like did you know that you had something special in term in terms of this sensitivity that could become a resource for your recovery? I knew that. 
I was somewhere on like the more sensitive end of a spectrum, I guess, that because, you know, other people that I would were hung out with didn't seem to be as bothered or as intuitive or as whatever as I was. Um, I didn't know the extent of it. I didn't know the gap. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was probably over a decade until I like really understood like, oh my God, this is legit. I mean, also mm. I'm in New York City, like it's like a, a, it's the Olympics of pessimism and, and realism and, you know, New York City is like all, it's super um, mental, uh -huh. you know, it's like, how can I think my way out of this problem? How can I solve this with my mind? How can I power through and muscle through and dominate and compete and all these masculine energies and I was like ramped up to level 10 like mm. that. And I was operating like that and I wasn't dropping down into like the heart center or the, you know, like my, even though I had intuition, I was ignoring it most of the time or just not, uh -huh. not validating it, not valuing it. Yeah, well, it's like a, a cricket in Times Square, right? You know, it could be singing beautifully, but you can't hear it because of all the, yeah. the honking and the fire and the sirens. And... Yeah. Okay. And I can, so, be, I can be smart and clever and aggressive and get her done and roll my sleeves and work for 10 days in a row. I, you, you know me, you know, I can still do that. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make it healthy. That doesn't make it good for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you started doing this this um, organic form of biofeedback, assessing mm -hmm. everything in your environment. What what first told you that it was working? Hmm. I discovered EFT tapping, uh -huh. and I started to play with that. And I didn't believe in it at the time. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> and as I tried it um, specifically for pain reduction at the time, nothing really emotional, just pain reduction and like how frustrated I was around pain. Um, it started working better than any of the pharmaceutical painkillers that I uh, it started calming me down and like letting the pain come down and letting me sleep better than any drug that I had been taking. So I had evidence and it wasn't like a one and done thing. Like it was, it literally became like a practice, you know, you do like rounds and rounds and rounds of it uh -huh. until uh -huh. like you feel that from, you know, level 10, it takes maybe rounds and rounds just to get to nine. Mm. And then you suddenly, you know, it catches, it'll catch. And then it'll start to hit, you know, stick. And then after days and days and weeks and weeks, like that was, that was my first evidence of like the power of my own body to mm -hmm. heal. And I started to come off of the, the medications. Like, I mean, it took three years to come off of eight drugs, yeah. but I was committed. All right. And were you working in fashion during those three years or just living off savings or? I got back to, I got back to full-time fashion. Um, and, but I was also really, you know, like when you're done with your marriage, <laughs> you're like really done with it and you're like, oh, I got to get out of this thing. They're like, there is no hope. Um, so I just started to, um, look for, look for other ways of like doing the, the, what I had discovered is like my, my true purpose, which is like that, that bodhisattva calling, you know? Um, so yeah, I started to become obsessed with all things, health, wellness. Um, I walked into my job and my, the, my, 
the bosses where I worked at the time were wonderful people. And they, you know, were like, take all the time you need. Like, these are our policies, but don't worry about the policies. We got you. Mm -hmm. Like, this is crazy. Uh Um, They were super nice to me. So at that time, when I went back to work, I sat down in the office and I just looked them both in the face because husband and wife owners. I looked at them. I was like, for the past X years, you know, I've been involved at, you know, full throttle, 24 seven, whatever you need. I've been on this emotional roller coaster ride with you. You know, we've lost tens of thousands of dollars. We've made tens of thousands of dollars. Like there's been these huge ups and downs. That industry is crazy. Um, but I can't, I can't be on the emotional ride with you anymore. Mm. I, I'm here. I'm giving my hundred percent. I'm getting the job done, but I can't feel anything about it with you. So if it seems to you like I don't care because you're not getting the reaction that you want out of me, that's I, I can't care about your what you think. Like I literally cannot, I can't sustain it. So your emotional stuff has got to be your stuff and I'm here to do my job, but I'm not going to feel anything about it anymore. Mm. Was that, was that hard to get yourself to, to say, was it a. a Not at that point, because I had let go of life. I mean, Uh (laughs) I was like, like, what are you going to do to me that hasn't already like. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's like, yeah, I became. I became truly fearless uh-huh. as the subtle, the subtle art. I became truly fearless. I was like, there's nothing uh-huh. that anybody can say or do to me right now. I'm mm. completely invincible. Uh huh. That sounds pretty healing all by itself. <laughs> I would, I would wish for everybody to feel like that without having to suffer. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, like that was the, the feeling like just kind of, you know, F it. Mm-hmm gloves off like this is a thousand percent real so yeah i i was still in fashion and obsessed with all things health wellness fitness nutrition like everything physical i'm like how do i actually take care of myself i had to learn you know from the from scratch i had no mentorship or guides and i didn't have a coach health coaching wasn't really a thing yet yeah um and I went to Barnes and Noble, if anybody remembers like physical bookstores. Uh-huh. Which um, which one? The one on Sixth Avenue? Union Square. Okay. Yeah, I went to that yeah. store. I think that's now that's now a Whole Foods, I think. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been there in so long. But so I went on, four, on 14th. Right yeah. Right yeah, across yeah. from the park. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I sat there, I pulled out some books and I read for the first time, like that there could possibly be like natural solutions to arth- to JRA and autoimmune disease. And I started reading about like molecular mimicry and, you know, the whole, the whole thing with leaky gut, the theory. The, and I was like, well, this kind of makes sense, you know? So let me just try. And at that point I was like, kind of willing to try anything. I wasn't, you know, I had no resistances to change. Um, mm-hmm. I had zero resistance to changes because I just didn't give any. Yeah. You know, I was like, you want me to eat a bucket of coal? Sure. Like, <laughs> <laughs> bring it. And that's, um, that's how it began. And I, I started to, uh, again, I didn't know how to cook. I had zero skills. I could barely boil water and make like craft mac and cheese and open a can of tuna. Like I was not domesticated at all. It was feral. And <laughs> <laughs> I had to, to learn. And I also didn't have, I don't want to say that I didn't have supportive friends because I, like all my friends cared a great deal, but they, they didn't have the skills or live the life that I wanted to learn. Yeah. You know, so I had they, to. Yeah. They couldn't follow you where you were going. No, they wanted to still meet out at, you know, for happy hour and eat chicken wings. And I'm just like, what is this chinois? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was learning 
from scratch what you know what what a whole grain was i don't think i ever even like made rice in my life um so there i was in like my 30s trying to figure out how to build a pantry how to cook things what's i didn't have any taste for spices like i didn't i was just very very clueless and uh, made a lot of bad meals and <laughs> ate them anyway and learned over time and that's that was kind of the dawn also of youtube and that was also the dawn of like smart tvs mm -hmm. and so i realized that because i had fomo all my friends are going out and partying i'm stuck here alone in my kitchen which i hate at the smallest little kitchen in queens and it was old and ugly and not user friendly and functional. And there was like no counter. It was like being in a boat or a ship or something like it was a tiny little space. And I'm like, I have got to make myself enjoy being in this room. And so I did this thing that I call now like pimp your kitchen. I pimped my kitchen. <laughs> I painted it American cheese yellow. And <laughs> that was the name of the color. And I, you know, got a couple pots and pans and a knife and a mat for under my feet. And I basically, I, you know, made it a room I would enjoy being in. And I put a little smart TV. It was a Google TV. I don't think they make them anymore. Tiny little screen where I could make myself not feel lonely. Hmm. And make myself learn and explore my curiosities about learning while I was in the room of the kitchen. So, you know, I, I got Food Matters TV. I remember I subscribed to that so I could watch all the documentaries about all of the food stuff. And, you know, you can't, you can't be interested in health and wellness without, um, eventually becoming an environmentalist because you start to see the connect, you connect the dots or the dominoes, right? It's like my physical body is the sum of all the elements. Like mm -hmm. I'm my physical wellness is what I'm putting in my body. And then also the air I breathe and the water I drink and the, the soil that my food is growing in. Like when you start to learn about, physical health and then lifestyle medicine and nutrition and you study nutrition, you study farming and agriculture and, and all of that. And the, it, it all starts to kind of make sense. You're like, Oh my God, no wonder I was so sick. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's almost like the, the, the obverse of the systems you were discovering in fashion, right? Where you, you start out, you know, teenage girl fantasy of making beautiful dresses and then you discover factories and pollution and you discover it's part of this, this environmental cycle of decay and degradation. And now on the other side, you're looking at food and discovering, oh, there's there's that cycle, but there's also a possibility for a healing regenerative cycle. Yes. And that's what I'm obsessed with now is that, um, you know, pain pushes, vision pulls. I changed because of pain. And now I finally have vision. Uh huh. And that vision I have now, and I promise I wasn't really even trying to segue to PBCC, but we'll just go there. Let's, um, let's go there. What I'm thinking in my head is that we have to do part two, where we go over your entire coaching journey, because you're such an amazing coach and you've had so many great experiences. But if you're willing to give me another hour at some point in the next few weeks, um, I'm happy to just segue to PBCC with a, with a promise to the audience that we will do our best to, to pick up your story. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. fine. Um, yeah. So this the vision now is, is what we're doing, you know, is what you and I get to do. It's the, it's what you're doing. It's the space that you hold for these conversations. It's the, opening of the door to possibility and the, you know, people, I think it was Jim Rohn that said, stand guard at the doorway of your mind, you know, Ooh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Stand guard at the doorway of your mind, because what comes into your mind, like what you, 
what you decide to think about, especially on repeat, you know, thought becomes a belief. Thought repeated becomes a belief. Mm -hmm. So that said, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of choice. We have much more choice than we think we do. You know, we can choose what, who to surround ourselves with and who to, who to talk to and listen to. And, um, and these conversations, like the work that you're doing is the hope for me. It is the vision. It is the, what we're doing is the vision, the, where I want to see the world go. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that vision and, and is, you know, whatever specifics um, make sense? Um, sure. I guess I covered this a little bit in one of the, at the workshop that we did for coaching. Um, is that still available for on, on repeat or? I think it is. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make a note. Find to it. Drop, if you can send me that, I'll drop a link in the show notes. Sure. Um, the... Before I decided that I like when I was still on my quest to find my answer in conventional medicine, and I had an idea that nutrition would be a part of the solution, or it was actually well, basically it wasn't something that I had explored at all yet. So I found a nutritionist um, who was she was part of. Um, and this is not, I'm not trying to slander anybody because I had a bad experience, but I had a bad experience. It was a, a, a holistic like wellness center that was new at the time in New York City and it was cash only. And I you know, spent, um, it, it was the most grueling taxi ride to get there and back, you know, from Queens to Midtown. It was like all bumpy and my body's in complete pain and every single bump hurts. And I get there and I'm, I'm show up on the wrong day. Uh, literally a complete meltdown in the lobby and the receptionist was like oh my god and i was mm. like i can't come back <laughs> and so they fit me in i see this um rd who was understandably um stressed and trying to squeeze me in and now having been on the other side of working in a wellness center I know what her day must have been like. So I do, you know, I'm not trying to bash her because she was, if you have to see 15 people in a row in eight hours and like know what, and like remember their story and, and hold space for them and have the right answers and give them just the thing that they need, like it's not an easy job. No. You know, and there I was like, please talk to me. I'm dying. <laughs> I'm like, so I get in and I see her and it was just the worst visit ever. I, you know, she barely looked at me. She printed out like 15 to 20 pages worth of information about molecular mimicry and on autoimmune disorder. And, and I think she maybe gave me an elimination diet list. I don't remember. She did all, she, all of her information was completely accurate. It, the timing couldn't have been worse for what she was giving. Like there was a mismatch in looking up at the person in front of you and, and thinking like, where's this person at? What do they need? I need to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. Or even just the thought of like asking the person in front of you, what do you hope to walk away with today? Yeah. What do you need? What can I do? How can I serve? You know, just that question of looking at them and that didn't happen. And so I left way more overwhelmed and hopeless than I walked in. I didn't know what to have for dinner and I was in total body pain and I got home and I lived on a four story walk up and I did get upstairs and I look like a young, healthy person but I'm moving like I'm 90 something years old, you know, just like one step at a time. Like mm -hmm. I finally get all the way upstairs and I'm like, I can't do another day of this. I'm going to end my life right now. This is the end. I've got to escape this. There's no, there's no hope. And I look up and I'm like the, my rooftop was one flight up 
and I could not take another, I physically couldn't take another step. And all I wanted to do was jump off the roof. <sighs> so, <laughs> like, <Wow. clears throat> um, but yeah, that's the only reason I'm here right now is because I couldn't take one more step. And that night I, you know, it was like one of those like long meditative nights of just more hopelessness. But how did I get into that? So fast forward again, we were talking about, we we're talking about. Well, the PBCC about your vision for what you, what you want to bring the to the world. The vision is that moment of me walking in that office when I looked at that person who didn't meet me where I was. I don't want anybody else to have that moment. I want coaches in every single doctor's office. I want coaches at every school, every senior center. I want coaches out in the world in every professional setting to work with healthcare providers to be that missing link, to be that person that can sit there and say, what do you need? Or you just had this visit, visit with this doctor and you didn't understand a word of it. What do you need? Mm. Mm. How can I help translate that to your reality? How can I help like make it practical and tangible and real? And, you know, like, what's the first thing you should do? Let's unpack this. Where are you at? To me, the, the coaching is the heart and soul of, of wellness. It's not up in the mind. It's not the problem solving. It's not the thinking through of like powering through and muscling through and dominating with that New York city energy. It's the, it's the dropping down into listening to the intuition and the heart. Mm. And that is the, it's the heart and soul of healing. It's the putting that other person first. It's, I think that's the vision I have for the world is for more people to be versed in this work we do mm -hmm. and for it to be valued by society and for it to be embraced and welcomed into every setting it can possibly be welcomed into and have value in. And I want to build that army with you. Mm. And it's really, it's really calling for like a huge cultural shift of, of valuing the not knowing, valuing the space holding, valuing the, the, the seeing the resources, right? That that person did not see you as resourced, even though underneath all the sickness and, and all the bad habits and all the hopelessness and all the pain were some were tremendous resources. Um, I think to you know to be able to to create that that peaceful army is also to tell the world that there you know there's another way of being that is equally if not more valuable than the just you know head down striving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that power is inside of us. And when you're sitting with somebody who is beat down, just beat down and sick and feels like hot garbage, it's the, the knowing that they have all the makings of a much better reality within mm. them. And it's seeing that light in them. Yeah. And boy, your your story means it's awfully hard for anyone to come to you and say you don't understand how how unlikely it is for me to heal. You don't understand the pain I'm in, the deficit, the confusion, right? <laughs> right. We didn't even talk about my my PTSD father with alcoholism. We didn't even talk about you know <laughs> like oh, all okay. of the other things that kind of come into the making of any one person's story. And and I don't say that because I really like need to explore that or or want to. I'm just saying that like everybody is so multifaceted. 
which is why coaching is so fascinating because yeah. you dig into that with an individual and they have, they always have their own answer. Yeah. Yeah. And what I, one thing I was thinking is like, your answer was utter surrender, mm. right? That's not to say that that's everybody's answer, right? Okay. Someone's answer might be, I'm going to fight like hell. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right? Like, like, you can't, it's like, I don't want someone to take this story and say, oh, I know how to help people now. <laughs> <laughs> Lay down and try to die. No? <laughs> yeah. Right. Give, give up, surrender, let go. Like I know plenty of people for whom the first step in healing was moving from hopelessness to just rage. Yes. To outrage. Yeah. And, you know, we don't like to talk about, you know, rage or negative emotions or hate or things like that. But for for a bunch of people, people that, that I that I know, it was sort of, you know, fury at the pharmaceutical industry or the food industry or the education industry or the fashion industry. Yeah. Oh, I went through all that. I went through that stage too. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's really, uh, it's easy to become when you learn something like fanatical about it, you know, like the person that quits smoking and then like, they've been smoking for 30 years, they kick it and now they don't ever want to see anybody else smoke. And they're, you know, mm. the preacher on the street about that thing. Like I, that's why you know i'd say like everybody calm down all the time because <laughs> yeah because people are in their own stage of whatever emotion yeah. like that vibrational scale right going from yeah that... and, and that's another another reason that that coaching education has to be a, a, a self-development program too because i could have all the techniques and skills but until i've worked out kind of my own uh, trajectory and, and kind of I've learned the lessons and then I have to let go of the lessons. Yeah. So, so that I'm just, I'm an, I'm an open reflection for the person in front of me that I don't think, you know, if that, if I, if I succeeded by first becoming enraged, I might want that for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Or if I succeeded by giving up, and surrendering and hearing voices to say, hey, this is your step. Mm -hmm. You know, I can become very attached to that as the way. And, you know, the, the work we do in training coaches is really, okay, okay, let's, let's figure out what are the triggers and drivers that are going to keep us from being wholly present. What, mm -hmm. what are the echoes of the past that could get in the way that we need to be aware of? so that we can be present right here, right now with this person's infinite, unique reality. Infinite, unique reality. Yeah, and ever changing. Yeah, yeah. moment to moment. Yeah. yeah. Do, can you want to talk just for a few minutes? I know we're, we're, we're out of the time that you promised me, but if you have a couple more minutes, can you t talk about like how you thought about putting together the coach training like so you've got all these experiences you became a health coach which mm -hmm. we have we have completely elided so far we're going to come back to it but yeah. like now you're you're thinking like okay here's my mission how how what are some of the things you thought about and wanted to manifest in the program that were important to you mm. uh well the, th the thing that comes to mind like right away up top up high is compassion um I feel like um, there there are standards that are established in coaching, scientifically established, repeatable working standards. And it's good that people are, it's good that we've collectively agreed on, on at least that much. It's kind of like with um, whole food plant-based eating, you know, there's a lot of debate around nutrition and like, is vegan like the best diet and this or paleo or whatever. There's all of this noise, right? But the one thing that everybody can agree on is like the more plants, the better. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually something that there's a, there's a core that everybody can agree on. Plants are good. <laughs> we need them. Um, you know, we just, all, all my all my carnivore viewers are just you know hung up, <laughs> dropped off. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that being a vegan is right for everybody. It's not. 
you know, it doesn't mean that it, whatever, but like, it's, it's not about these, uh, again, the camps or the black and white, it's the scale and like you finding your own way on it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. um, that, that said, like, it's the same for, to me, for coaching, like the, the benefit of us having, of coaching, having an established core, um, standard is that that's our way of finding validity in the field, the medical field that could potentially, you know, we can lobby and become a, a real uh, job one day. Like we're not even, Ooh, I don't know how. Wow. That. Wow. For people who are watching on YouTube, we just, we just had a confetti party. Did you, did you do gestures that, that triggered I guess so. Real. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> I just learned that too right now. But we're, um, you know, we would like for insurance to be able to pay for coaching. We would like, we would like to be part of um, that reimbursement model, right? Because right now coaching is considered a, like a luxury out of pocket expense. And yeah. it's, yeah much to the, it hurts everybody. So if we can say, okay, like we're real, we're established, we're not, you know, we're not even in the, um, the U S uh, the labor bureau doesn't even count code health coaching as mm. a job right now. Like we don't even exist mm. on the map. It's been over, I've been in this, I've been doing this job for over 11 or 12 years now, maybe 12. And I'm doing a profession that, that my country says doesn't exist. Like that's, doesn't feel good. And it doesn't, it takes like every 10 years for them to review and agree on what is going to be a new job and give it a code and uh -huh. all that stuff. So that's kind of all background stuff. And like, if you already have a PhD or if you're already an RN, or if you're already something else, maybe you don't care about this issue, but if you are only a health coach, you would like to be validated. And you would like to have, uh, you know, have your expenses be covered and et cetera and find jobs and all of that stuff. So it's important that we do align on some core principles to fight that fight. Um, beyond that, what I really love that we do and I feel is special about PBCC is we've brought in you, we've brought in Elliot Connie, we've got other people that are doing um, techniques that, that they've found have worked or summarize or simplify or, you know, more practical, tangible, you know, just try this or think of it this way. Um, so by that, I feel like we are teaching a little bit of artistry around coaching and other coaching programs. Like I went to IIN, I didn't really learn how to coach. Mm. I know that's, I, I kind of did. Um, but certainly not in this focus way that we're doing and not with the live, you know, live element and mentorship. I think they've added that on now, but it's like an, it's an add on. And I, as we already work a lot of live stuff in and we still don't qualify to mm -hmm. be NBHWC's accredited just yet. We, it takes a ton of live synchronistic hours that I don't think our students would really want to sign up. Like say we have 300 students, maybe 50 of them actually care about that. So why design the whole program around that? Yeah. You know, so we'll probably do something else about that later, but any hoodle. Um, I feel like we, our ability to balance this, I mean, our expertise in whole food plant-based nutrition is second to none, you know? So we've got that covered and we've got awesome coaching training covered. And we've got um, the the like the business professional training. If you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to find a job, if you want to just be a change maker. When I say just, I don't mean. I actually hate that word. I hate that I just used that word. Can we delete that? <laughs> Are you uh, <laughs> like, or, or we could leave we could leave in your uh, retraction. It'd be yes, more powerful. Leave in the retraction because if you want to be a change maker in your community, maybe you're not looking to be a for profit. You know, we're going to have leaders and all these um, experts in these three kind of areas helping to coach people to brainstorm live this 
their own path in the world with this work and training that they learn from us. So even if you just want to learn this stuff for yourself, I mean, you and I got to really experience people um, coming back to us right away, right? Like week one, right? Like this one class has changed my relationship with my wife and my kids. Yeah. Yeah. One class. <laughs> is well, that cause coach, co- yeah. Cause coaching is a very counterintuitive mode of being and communicating. Mm-hmm. And if you think about, you know, the people in your life who you wish would change in some way and the ways in which you have been trying to push, pull, cajole, motivate, Manipulate. encourage them to change, yeah. probably not only have not been working, but damage your relationship, whether whether in big ways or little subtle ways. And coaching is kind of what, do look at that and do the opposite. And it's very mm-hmm. counterintuitive because we're not taught how to do it. Mm-hmm. We don't get mo- role models for how to do it. One of the things I ask my, my students in the very first week is, that, tell me how many times you've ever felt really listened to mm-hmm. by another person. And a lot of them can't think of a time and if they have, it's like, what, what was that experience like? It's like, you know, the opposite of hell. It was heaven to be really seen and taken in. Because now imagine you had that superpower. Imagine everybody you met would feel that way when they're around you. What could you get done? What could you help them get done? Yeah, to have somebody speak with you and, or listen to you and not judge what you're saying. You get to actually be honest like Mm -hmm. really pure honesty, like raw and be loved anyway. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's, let's, let's uh, stop here. Let people know um, like a little bit about the, like how they can find out about the program and I'll, I'll drop a link in the show notes. Um, Gosh, I don't even know the website off the top of my head. But okay. if you, you go know, to, I'll, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it. I'll put it in. That way, uh, I can I can sneak in my affiliate link. And, yeah, uh, yeah, you could totally great. Take, get, um, get credit, um, but it starts in January twenty twenty four. It does. Yeah, it starts in January. I think. Um, you know, there. If you go to foodrevolution dot org, there's a drop down menu about like what I love about food rev is that they're not like, they're so giving, right? And you land, when you go to their website, you land on their blog, which is high, 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 high quality, super informative, free information. Like it's so there's, it's not full of ads. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Um, and then if you want to actually find what they sell, <laughs> there's like, a, a you can't just, it doesn't land on that. Right. It just goes to, goes to the free stuff, but if you go to, um, I think it's more and you drop down the menu, it says plant-based coaching certification. If you click on that, that'll be, you know, all about the program. Um, but your, your link also would get them directly there and you could support, you could support Howie and plant the plant yourself podcast. Yes. I I love that phrasing from food revolution. It's like, if, if you click on, on, on this link, and join the coach training, you'll be helping to support the Plant Yourself podcast. Yes. In, yeah. Yeah. In the, for, in, wanna, in the form of me. <laughs> we want to support you. Yeah. I mean, doing this work, part of, part of the vision that I have for coaches and what we're doing is that we actually can keep our lights on. You know? Well, and that's, that's <laughs> excuse me, one of the things I loved about, you know, the people we were, we were working with, Melinda and, and Sage and mm-hmm. like, most people I know who are inclined to be home health coaches also are inclined to take vows of poverty because they feel like making money is bad or would take away from the mission. Right. And as a result, we have an ar- we have an army of impoverished health coaches or people who are unable to do the health coaching because they have to keep the lights on doing something else. Yeah. It's funny, like as if you could become Jeff Bezos anyway in this <laughs> In this industry, like it, you're only going to be able to make so much. It's not like there's this, uh, in, I don't know why people are so afraid of money, but they are. And I think most people you talk to just basically want to sustain a certain quality of life. And it's not out, it's not outlandish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
well, a friend of mine's an economist and you know very, very progressive, and he's like, you know, if you make ten million bucks a year, you're not—that's not really hurting anyone. It's the billionaires that I have that I worry about. Like, all right, there's well. there's just there's so much out there that if you you know if you make a good living, you're really not taken away from anybody else. No. And of course, when you make a good living, you then have some some means to be helpful. Uh, that's yeah, that's the bigger thing. Yeah, we could unpack that next time because I I really do want to. We, I think that part of the story is important to cover too. Yeah, well, and I love you know in the one of the first uh, trainings that Ocean did, I'll I'll give a little away about the impact filler. He, he said this sentence that I wrote down and refer to frequently. This is his his money prayer. Right. It's like, may I be given what I need to do what I'm here for? Yeah. 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 No, it's yeah. funny because I was laying in bed one night, fretting over my finances. And I went to bed that night. I was like praying to all of my ancestors. I'm like, look, you guys, you better help me out here. Because if you don't make this easier for me, I can't keep doing it. Mm -hmm. The next day. I got an email from Food Revolution Network inviting me to apply for a certain position at the time. And I was like, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Nice. Nice. All right. And uh, do you do private coaching now or is it, your, is it everything you're doing through Food Revolution? Um, that's a really good question. I've slowed down to a sprinkling of helping old relationships when they need it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even have an email anymore okay. to give out. But Okay. Well, the good news is you are training hundreds of yes. coaches. So <laughs> if, if, if someone's here like, oh, I want Tracy, well, you can have uh, Tracy 2.0, right? Just... Yeah, yeah. I mean... Gosh, I, don't, I, I don't know if that page is up yet with the uh, graduates of the program. Um, we yeah, they're they're listed now on um, uh, what is it? The Plantrition Projects listings. Oh, okay, I'll put a link to that as well. Yeah, Plantrition Project. You can find a practitioner, and you can find a um, a plant based certified coach, an FRN plant based certified coach. It's like a special badge that they went through our program in particular that they're expert at plant-based eating. And when I say, say plant-based, people listening, that doesn't mean you need to be a vegan, okay? Everybody come. Mm -hmm. like, you can just eat yeah, more plants right. and you'll feel better. And right. these people will help you get whole food, unprocessed, awesome, like really well-balanced, high, high nutrition. Yep. And non-judgmentally. In a non-judgmental, loving way. Right. Because <laughs> we hate judgmentalism. <laughs> all right tracy thank you so much this has been so much fun yeah um, and i'm glad um i was able to you know ask you on camera whether you would come back and do another one so yeah, I, sure have, will. I, have, I have the proof so I'll we'll, we'll work that come, out coming straight from the gym next time look at me i'm a i'm a mess anyway oh well <laughs> <laughs> i think i think you're a fashion icon so well, well. <laughs> sure, me and Anna Wintour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tracy, thanks so much. Uh, we'll talk again soon. And uh, thanks for all you do in the world and for taking the time today. Thank you, too, Howie. Love you. Okay. Love Bye. you, too. Bye.